Hoops Heaven proudly brings to you Basketball Hustle, featuring your host, the writer, Chris Pike, and the scoring machine, Sean Redditch. Now it's time for another episode of Hoops Heaven's Basketball Hustle. Hello and welcome to another week of Hoops Heaven's Basketball Hustle, and it just never seems to stop. We've got plenty to talk about once again this week. It seems to be more and more to talk about for us every single week here on the show. Of course, we'll have, as always, the Tab Touch preview with Matty Knight. We'll have the Demo Award with Damian Martin, thanks to Boomerang. But the rest of the show, as we dissect everything happening in the NBL, plenty happening on and off the court for us to get through, and there's only one man to do it with. So I'll be joined by the scoring machine, Sean Redditch, once again. How do we find you now on the eve of Easter, Sean? Oh, look, our uh, Term 1 program's finishing up this week, so uh, looking forward to a few days of uh, some rest and recovery before we got some camps coming next week, and uh, looking forward to the to the Easter break. Mm. It's uh, It's been a, a good good term, but uh, ready, for, ready for a little break in, uh, break in the action. Yeah, and it, it's, it's a strange one. I don't know if we've ever had an NBL season in your career that's run run through Easter. At least if it is, it's deep into the finals or grand final time. It, it feels strange to say that we're getting to April and we're halfway through an NBL season. It is, you know, and there's still quite a few games to be played. You feel like yeah. they've, they've already played, especially the NBL Cup with the games almost every other day. That, uh, you know, normally by this this time in the season, 17 games in, you'd only have 10 or 11 games, but they mm-hmm. still got, you know, the Wildcats, if you're looking at their schedule, they still got 19 more games <laughs> to play. Yep. So that's a lot yep. of games. A lot can happen over the rest of the season. Absolutely. And the Breakers as well, they've got 20 to go. Um, so, yeah, there's plenty to get through. So why don't we start off by going back through what we saw in round 11. Sean, I'll run through the results and you can tell me what stood out to you. So it started... Back on Thursday night, and it was a tight one. Melbourne United got the win over the New Zealand Breakers, 82-79 to in Bendigo. And then the game that you saw, saw close up, the Perth Wildcats, 81. They had to come from behind to beat the Illawarra Hawks, 70. Um, the New Zealand Breakers then played well to beat to get a win on the board. They beat the Brisbane Bullets, 81-76. to Big win for Melbourne United, 80-60 to over South East Melbourne Phoenix. And then a massive statement performance, I thought, from the Perth Wildcats in Sydney, to beat the Kings 89 to 65. Cairns Taipans, important bounce back win for them, 79 over the Adelaide 36ers, 65. And then to finish up Monday night, huge win for the Illawarra Hawks, their second home game only of the season, and they made the most of it 96 to 72 over the Brisbane Bullets. What stood out to you, Sean, out of all of that? Oh, there's probably a few things. I think the Brisbane Bullets missed a big chance. That week mm-hmm. to uh, to really kind of cement themselves into that top four. That loss to the Breakers at home is uh, it could be one that they kind of look back at the end of the season. Could be the one that knocked them out of the finals. Yeah, could be. I, I like the way the Hawks are playing. I know they lost to the Wildcats, but you know no one's playing as good as the Wildcats are at the moment. And uh, the first the Hawks, half was really good, wasn't it? They were fantastic yeah. and probably just missing. That next scoring punch in the third mm. quarter when they kind of needed someone to step up the score for them. But defensively, they were outstanding, I thought. And then they showed, you know, they finally got a home game. And that's why I think they're they're in that driver's seat to get into the top four because they got so many home games. And you see, you know, 24-point win against Brisbane. They looked really good at home. Yeah, absolutely. So let's go through the standings just quickly at the end of round 11 and as we now prepare for round 12 to start on Thursday night with a couple of games. We've got the the Wildcats still out on top 13 and 4. Melbourne United right on their hammer 13 and 5. Illawarra Hawks 10 and 8. The South East Melbourne Phoenix 10 and 8. Then just outside the top 4, Sydney Kings 9 and 9. Brisbane Bullets are 9 and 9. And then as you as you touched on last week, I still think this bottom 3 is probably out of the race, just about you would think. The Adelaide Thirty Six is seven and thirteen, New Zealand Breakers five and thir- five and eleven, sorry, and the Cairns Taipans five and fourteen. Do you still see it as a race between those top, those top six? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, this last round doesn't change much mm-hmm. in my opinion. You know, Thirty Sixers losing to the Taipans, who haven't won a lot this season, is uh, probably a sign of where they're at at the moment and. The Breakers are just going to find it tough. I mean, they're five and eleven to be able to get wins while they're on the road is mm. going to be it's going to be extremely extremely tough. And, and we'll talk about their 
their scenario a little bit later, but it's a uh, you know, commendable effort, I think, to get that win against the Bullets, and I think they'll surprise some teams, but it, dig yourself out of a 5-11 hole is going to be tough. Yeah, it will be. Okay, let's, let's dig a little bit deeper on some of those teams. Let's start at the top with the Perth Wildcats because they had to dig deep on Friday night to win that game at home against the Hawks, and then to back it up, Short turnaround, I think it was only sort of 40 hours between games and flying across the country to then dominate the Sydney Kings how they did. Um, you can't not be impressed with what they're, they're producing right now. Um, it put, puts them on a, a seven-game winning streak, and you have to like what they're doing. Well, I think they just have that that second gear where they can go to on the, on defense. I mean, we've mm-hmm. seen it a few times this, this season, that 36ers win on the last – uh, game in the NBL Cup where they came yep. back from 21 down at halftime. They just got this gear that no other team, kind of similar, I kind of felt like the Kings were last year when they had Bogut and um, they were just outstanding defensively. They could just kind of turn it up a notch and, and put the clamps on teams. That's that's the way the Wildcats are playing at the moment. And, uh, you know, that Kings game, it, it was close up until halftime. And then, you know, the rebounding, you know, Adam their coach Sydney Kings, he he talked about Adam Ford that yeah. you know they're just on a whole nother level as far as their rebounding and the, the, you know the Wildcats aren't even the best rebounding team in the comp. It's actually the Illawarra Hawks, so mm. that gives you a little bit of you know where the teams that are great rebounding are, are at the top of the the standings and uh, and so I think that's probably why the Hawks were able to stay in that game against the Wildcats as well because they can match them at athleticism and rebounding wise. Yeah, it doesn't always reflect on the stat sheet, but when you watch a game that Perth wins, you always get the feeling that they've dominated the boards, and I think it's just the effort. They are always crashing the glass, and if they don't get the rebound, they've always given it full effort to get the rebound, and the offensive rebounds are massive, and and those games on the weekend, they ended up winning the possession game by quite a lot, and it's all on the back of that effort just to get the offensive rebounds and to get the extra shots, and you know better than anyone. You played under Trevor Gleeson. How much of a focus is it to end up winning the possession game because you know that you're just not going to lose too many games if you end up taking more shots than the other team. Well, it is a big part of Trevor Gleason. And, you know, I just remember Tommy Jervis really excelled under Gleason, especially, you know, that first kind of because Mm -hmm. he loved the ability for Jervis to go get rebounds. You know, that was his one role pretty much and then he developed his offensive game and his passing and made himself into a really good NBL player but if you can rebound you can play it and you know I asked Trevor Gleason after the game against the Illawarra Hawks what was it that you know they really liked about John Mooney and it was purely just the fact that he could rebound and you know if you can rebound you can play for Trevor Gleason and it, it sets the tone that um, you know, defense, you can play the best defense, but you don't grab that ball, yep. it, it, it's meaningless. And so it kind of sets the tone in that. I just still remember that my first season, how much of an emphasis he put put on rebounding. It's it's showing, uh, you know, year in and year out and probably a big reason why they've had a lot of success over the years. It's actually a pretty simple formula, and it's not always about the personnel because the Wildcats te- teams haven't always had the best natural rebounders, but it's all about – the effort and putting a focus on it. Are you surprised other teams don't put as much attention onto it? Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest. It does help to have guards that rebound well for their saws. Yeah. You know, you look at a Damian Martin, um, especially in his prime. I mean, yeah. he was just unbelievable at sniffing out that ball. Mitch Norton's the same. And then, you know, Jesse is not a great athlete, but he just, the amount of times, if you watch him over his career, the amount of times he actually tips the ball back, just finds a way. He goes every time. If he's not shooting the three, he is crashing and just, um, you know, it's just a it's just a mentality. And, you know, I think Luke Travers is one of those guys that kind of fits into that well. I actually thought, think though, the Wildcats do look a little small at times. I'm surprised that other clubs aren't attacking them in the paint. As good a rebounding as they are, they're not that tall. So, you know, we saw that with Nate J.Y. They gave them a little bit of issues, but um, other teams have been exploited. And probably the toughest thing is if you go big, then that big guy is going to have to switch out on a Bryce Cotton, which which makes it tough as well. So it's kind of... We saw saw Nate have to do that a couple of times. 
Yeah, and I think that's why you may not have a uh, you know those guys in later in the game because you just don't want them to get caught out an island against the best offensive weapon we've mm-hmm. seen in a long time. The other thing I'm really enjoying, we know how good Bryce is playing and how good Mooney's playing, how good Blanchfield's playing, but it seems like different guys are stepping up every game as well. So last Friday against the Hawks, Clint Steindl had his best game of the season, 17 points. And then on Sunday, Luke Travis had his, the best game of his career. Um, he started on fire sort of late in that first quarter when he came on. I think he had 16 points in the end, but I think um, 12 of those were just in a patch of about three minutes either side of quarter time. We've seen what Corey Sherville can do, sort of coming from nowhere as a development player to now show that he's an NBL player. Um, that's probably the most encouraging sign. It's these different guys that are stepping up too. Well, yeah. I mean, you look at the Friday night game and, you know, Bryce Cotton was struggling. Mooney wasn't putting up big numbers yet. And still, you know, the Southern Clint Donald knocks down some threes and kind of keeps them in contention before the rest of the guys kind of find their groove. You know, I, I, the other thing I noticed, Travers, I was watching him warm up in the game on Friday night. His three-point shot, it looks like it's not so much of a set shot anymore. And mm-hmm. I'm sure he's been working on it in the um, in his trainings and stuff. And then he knocks down three threes um, mm-hmm. against the Sydney Kings. So I, I noticed that. I was going to interested to see how he went in the game. But then I was glad to see he was... You know, he knocked down a couple. That should be good for his confidence because I think he was shooting under 10% mm. at, at one yeah. stage. But it, it just shows you, you know, you get into the professional environment. You can dial in on some of those details. And if he can become a three-point shooter that, you know, he doesn't have to shoot 40 45%. He doesn't have to be a Jesse Wagstaff. But he's got to be, you know, in that 35 yeah. to 38 range. With his defense and athleticism, he could be a, a dynamite player. Absolutely. Last but on the Wildcats, if the option becomes available to bring in an importer and if Bryce gets his citizenship with that player having enough time to play the amount of games needed to qualify for finals, would you do it right now? Or would you not putting at risk the chemistry that they've got right now? It's, a, it's an interesting one. I'm not, uh, I don't know if there's a, the right answer there. Uh, my only concern with not bringing in is if there is an injury to one of your really, really key guys, yeah. um, it covers, especially to say like John Mooney. I mean, if John Mooney goes down, that is a huge hole. I mean, yeah. I, I we, we talk about Tom Jervis being able to play, but I, I, at the moment, I think he's more a 10, 15 minute guy. He's not your 25, 30, 35 mm-hmm. minute guy that Mooney is. Um, and you don't really have last that long. He'll fail out. No. To that. Yeah. <laughs> so I think, I think that would be my biggest concern with 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 that. You bring in a guy just to kind of cover, almost like you know Miles Plumley as you know he didn't play a mm-hmm. ton of minutes, no, but he was he was um, he was real effective in the minutes that he did play. So um, that would be that would be my my thinking is bringing in a four or five that could kind of fill in some minutes if if you need to, and almost kind of be a bit of a luxury, but. You know the way they're playing, the way the chemistry. It's 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 a hard one to say that they definitely. I don't think they need it. You know if they're playing at the how they're playing at the moment, uh, if they just keep playing through Bryce Scott and he plays at that the the level he's playing. I don't think they need it, but you'll. Uh, I guess you just see if how how it plays out. But I get the feeling they're not gonna they're not gonna go that route. Mm. Yeah, it's probably looking that way, I would, I would assume, especially the longer that this takes. Um, now, what about Melbourne United? We were concerned about them, what we saw when they got hammered by the Sydney Kings a couple of weeks ago, but they've really locked down on their defence in their last three games. So they've won three straight, and they've only conceded 65 points, 79 points, and 60 points in those games. I still feel like their offence can, can get a lot better, but if you're only conceding those sort of numbers, um, you're going to be pretty tough to beat. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, defense wins championships and their ability to have Jacques Landale in the middle there kind of swallowing everything up uh, gives them a huge advantage. And I think that that's, you know, as they kind of start to click later on in the season, they'll, um, that'll, their defense will be a weapon for them. So I think that they're, you know, them and the Wildcats deserve to be top two and, and defense is probably the biggest reason. They've been most consistent in that regard, but I would be a little concerned with their offense at times. I think that they, mm-hmm. they kind of get bogged down and they're not as smooth and moving the basketball as well as they'd probably like. 
but as we, as we spoke, there's still 18 more games to kind of get that going. It's, it's harder to turn the switch on on defense than it is on offense. Yeah, for sure. And they've got Scotty Hobson to come back who gives them that little bit of an X factor on the offensive end as well. The New Zealand Breakers, I'm, I'm full of admiration for what they're doing. They've been away from home for, for five months now. There's no end in sight to that. Um, and they're pre- they pretty much played a lot. Since Corey Webster went down and since Lamar Patterson went down and Rob Lowe went home, they've pretty much been playing with six players. A couple of other guys get some old spot minutes, but basically it's six players that they've been going with. And Colton Iverson is now showing that he's a really good big man. Finn Delaney and Abercrombie as the, the leaders of the, the group have been terrific. Ty Webster's showing that he's a star in this league. And Rasmus Buck is showing he's a terrific shooter. They, they got a win over the Bullets. They haven't got a lot of wins. They're 5-11, and 11, but they've got some help coming. And I'm just full of admiration that we were really concerned at times early in the season that they would just capitulate, but they're showing a lot of spirit right now. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure all the hardships that they've had to being on the road for that long is kind of bonding them together, and they can kind of take some some prod in that. Uh, yeah, they've got, you know, the stack. The chip stacked against them at the moment, but they're, they're they are getting some quality wins, and they played better as of late. I, you know, if I, if I am the Breakers, I'm probably looking over the next 18 games and just kind of determine who we want in this club and in the culture. You know, this is two straight years there now that they've they've kind of started slow, yeah. Um, and so they've got to figure out how do we how do we start the season a lot better. I know they've had to deal with some crazy injuries. I mean, Corey Webster injuring his hand, cutting an avocado. <laughs> you just, you, it's hard to plan for that, right? But <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I guess I'd be disappointed with their start the last two years. I actually think they're going to, you know, towards the end of the year, just all this, you know, the camaraderie they've built, they're going to be a tough team to beat later on in the year. Probably a little bit too too late, but if they get Corey Webster back, I'm, I'm actually really excited to see McDowell White, see how much yep. he's progressed over the couple of years. I was really impressed with him as a, as a rookie with the Sydney Kings. So, yep. uh, you know, I think he's going to come in, surprise some players and, and probably just give them um, another, another, ball we'll, another ball handler. I mean, you could even throw Abercrombie at the four with yep. McDowell White at the three and then the Webster brothers at the one, two, that is That's a dynamic one through four. Um, and then put Colton Iverson in there as your screener. That could be a, a pretty potent lineup for the Breakers. Absolutely. And then you've still got Delaney and then other new import, um, Levi Randolph, to come in as well. So I think they've got plenty to work with. And then, then they've got Buck as well to, to be their shooter. So I think they'll be pretty pretty impressive throughout the second half of the season. I think they'll they'll start racking up some wins. Um, one team I'm not willing to say that about is the Adelaide 36ers. I've got some some real concerns over... Over the way they're tracking, they didn't look good up in Cairns. They lost to the Taipans, but I guess you can use the excuse that they were missing Isaac Humphreys, they were missing Josh Giddy, and they were missing Isaac's replacement in the starting five, Keanu Pinder as well. But the Taipans were missing Majuk Deng and, and Koat Noy as well, and the Taipans had been losing all of their games lately too. What do you think of the 36ers? And to me, the biggest question mark right now is, why is Brandon Paul not being used more? Yeah, it's a, it's it's an interesting one because you brought in a guy like that to be your spark plug, and yeah. your season's going south. Throw him out there, throw him out there, let him play, and uh, and see if he can kind of be be that spark. My, my sense is he's not the player that that Connor Henry wanted. Well, he in, looked like he was in his first two games, didn't he? He did. I mean, he looked, especially that first half against the Wildcats, he, he yeah. was outstanding. But I don't know the what's going on. If he doesn't like this scenario, if he wants to use him coming off the bench. But it, it doesn't look like it doesn't look like that's gelling with, with Brandon as well. I can understand maybe the first game, just get your legs. But, hey, mm-hmm. throw him out there. Your season's um, slipping away. He needs to be that, that score for you. Um, because you've got, you know, you've got some solid pieces there in Sunday Dutch and Daniel Johnson that that can kind of play around around him, but he yeah, needs to I mean, kind of be I mean, that. Yeah, absolutely. That Jack star. McVay's Jack McVay's playing well now. There's there's a lot of nice pieces there if you let your star import be a star import. But his last two games, he's only taken eleven field goals. It just doesn't make sense because we saw what he could do in those first two games and. He's not starting right now. We're not seeing him until sort of five minutes into into each half, and then he's he's just not able to get into the game. 
I just don't understand it. Yeah, I mean, they've come out and said there's some conditioning issues, um, but he doesn't look, to me, he doesn't look out of shape. And he's never, now that he's played, he tired, no. No, now that he's played a few games, that's why I think there maybe there's some underlying things there that, that might be going on that we may not be ability to see. Mm. But, yeah, I, I get the sense that he's not a long-term solution for him, so yeah, I'm trying to maybe... Good. But that'd, that'd you bring a guy out, you get, let him play, see if he maybe he can work himself in. I mean, you, you look at a guy, some guys that have come out here, they've started slow as imports, but you give them, you know, more opportunities and, and more experience, and they, they blossom into outstanding players. I, I look at a guy like Kevin Lish as one of those that uh, maybe started a little slow, but, geez, what a career he had. <laughs> yeah. Um, Connor Henry, you played under him as a coach. Um there was, there was question marks over his ability to coach by the end of that season he did coach at Perth. From what you've seen from the outside, is he a better coach now than he was 12 years ago? Oh, absolutely. I think he's, you know, he's got a lot more experience. That, that you know, when he came into the Wildcats, that was his first head coaching job yep. ever. So I, that's a tough gig to come into. And, uh, you know, I like some of the sets they're running. I think... You know, probably losing Isaac Humphreys has, has really hurt them. You know, yeah, just absolutely. kind of having that rebounding and a presence in the middle. Was your MVP race at that point? Yeah, Keanu Pender hasn't panned out. I think that's probably a signing they'll they're 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 not really happy with at the moment. Yep. Um, and so I, you know, I think he's a better coach, but you know, this is going to be it's going to be a test for him. Can he, um, you know, can he get the thirty sixers faithful believing in what he, he's, you know, his vision for the future, and and can they improve? You know, they're sitting seven and thirteen. They've got a lot of road games coming up. Are they going to be able to improve over the last sixteen games of the of the season? That's going to be. That's what I'd be looking at. Can can he can he improve the team and buy get them buying into his vision for what they want to look like? Yep, that's a good point. Just one final one before we get to your MVP votes. The Brisbane Bullets they played both their games last week without an import with Vic Law injured and Lamar Patterson still out injured. Should have they kept Orlando Johnson until Patterson was was fit to play because they re- they really missed having both imports out there on on the weekend. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't know the scenario around that because mm. obviously they wanted to sign Lamar Patterson. Was he going to go somewhere else if they didn't sign him? Oh, maybe, yeah. So, or you know, was he going to leave the country? So we don't know the little things, but you know, if he wasn't healthy, then keep your healthy guys playing, mm. especially if 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 you're not sure. Yeah, and then and, and we're I still think, not hearing that he's close. I don't think he's sort of close to coming back either. I still think he's at least. Two or three weeks away. Yeah, and then when Vic Law goes down, I, that really, yeah. really hurt them. That hurt my uh, multi last week. I was not expecting <laughs> that. So, um, you know, that they, they should have kept Orlando Johnson. Yeah, I think so. Or at least maybe they could have signed him as an injury replacement for Patterson or something. Um, it just, yeah, it's really hurting them right now not having an import. So we'll, we'll keep an eye on that. Now, as we talked about, plenty happened in round 11 of the of the NBL, Sean. Um, plenty of big performances. Do you want to run through your votes in our Hoop 7 Play of the Year award? Well, it's probably no surprise that Bryce Cotton gets another five votes. Mm. He's, uh, you know, putting a stranglehold on the lead at the moment. Uh, Mooney with four votes, two double-doubles. Wasn't probably his two best games, but just finds a way to get get things done. I just love yep. his rebounding, his... His arms and just tenacity, the length of his arms and his tenacity to go get the ball um, is, is fun to watch. Then I like Tyler Harvey. He, he, I thought he played okay against the Wildcats, but then he was outstanding in that win against against Brisbane. So he gets three votes. McCarron, um, he's just solid, you know, does all the little things. And uh, United got two wins as well. So he gets two votes. Um, and then Colton Iverson with that twenty rebound game, he gets one yep. vote. A couple of couple of new additions to our to our leaderboard, but you're right, Bryce Cotton stretching that lead. Um, he's out he's out to thirty one votes now, and Tyler Harvey into second spot on twenty, and then we've got John Mooney and Nathan Sobe on on seventeen, and and still Isaac Humphries on fifteen. Um, that's probably not too far off the All Star five right now, would it be? Yeah, I'd be pretty happy with that. 
Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're probably, you know, it's, it's a tough one with Isaac Humphreys because he's missed. I'd probably throw Jacques Landale in there yep. now. Yeah, but if, but if uh, Isaac comes back and plays well, then he's he's right in the hunt still, isn't he? Yeah, that's true. That's true. I think that you're uh, yeah, you're right, right in there. And then you see what uh, happens with, with some of the other guys that, that are coming back. We've got Mitch Greek coming back in, Big Law, yep. you know, depending on how long he's out. So there's some guys that still have a chance to crack in there. Casper Ware is always the ability to kind of explode and, and have a few weeks where he dominates. Mm. Okay, Sean, let's take a break. Um, there was a lot to get through there. We'll come back. We've got some big topics to talk about before we close the show. But in the meantime, let's let Damien Martin take over with his demo award, thanks to Boomerang. Then we'll have a tab touch preview with Matty Knight. And then I'll be back with you, Sean, the scoring machine. Okay, we're back here now on Hoops Evans Basketball Hustle, and it's time for the Demo Award, the best defensive player in the NBL Award, thanks to Boomerang. And make sure you check out Boomerang, the best basketball systems in the country. You can purchase your system, you can get it installed, and the custom flooring is out of this world. It's the best best in the business. You'll feel like you're floating on air, and you can also make it look however you like, design it however you like, and, and Boomerang will install it all. And thanks to their support here of the Demo Award, um, one of our listeners can go and purchase a above-ground basketball system right now with 50% off. Just mention Basketball Hustle. You can also get an in-ground system 25% off or some of those custom floorings that I talked about, 15% off just for being a listener here of Basketball Hustle. So thanks to Boomerang. And now let's got to get on to Damien Martin. Okay, I'm with Damien Martin on the Demo Award. Now, before we get to your votes, Damo, you're, you've got a big night ahead of you. You're about to get ready to head to RAC Arena and take on the microphone duties. How does getting ready for a game on the microphone compare to preparing for going to the arena to play a game? Is it, do you get some of the similar butterflies? Yeah, I'll probably actually get more nervous for the commentary than mm-hmm. I did for maybe the last four or five seasons. As a player, you kind of just have that routine as a player you're genuinely excited for the game you've already had you know three or four days worth of scouting going into the game whereas with the commentary it's also new I know I'm commenting commenting on you know a sport I love and and like to think I know a little bit about but yeah just not knowing when they're going to throw to you or whether you should speak up still getting to know that role in particular so I can honestly say I get more nervous for commentating than I do for uh, than I did for the last five seasons, five or six years as a player. So, no, I'm, I'm enjoying it so far. I've only got two games under my belt and I'm really looking forward to tonight's game. You know, the rematch against Sydney only a handful of days yeah. after first beating by 20 plus, which I don't think anyone was really expecting for it to go you know, that far a blowout. But you know, Casper Ware held a six points. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Mm-hmm. I just love the rivalry that the Wildcats seem to be establishing now with the Kings. Both teams seem to like playing on the opposition team's floor too. You go back to the grand final and, and the, it was the road team winning all of those games. So you would, you would think the Kings come in tonight, you know, holding no fears of playing in front of the Red Army. Yeah, oh, that game too was the most unique game I've ever <laughs> played in. Yeah, I was there. We only found out a, a, you know, an hour or two before tip-off that there'd be no crowd. And then, you know, credit to Will Weaver, I think we'd won, you know, four of the previous five games against them and, and no, neither team really mixed up our offenses or defenses. They've headed over here and in front of zero, mm. uh, very few people in the crowd. They've thrown in a triangle and two, which I've not seen since I was about eight years old. And, uh, and it worked. I mean, we couldn't hit a shot. It took us a while to adjust, and then it was too little too late, but then we made the adjustments. And, yeah, like you said, then as the away team heading to Sydney, it was um, a good one to be able to play, knowing where to screen, who's going to get open. And, and Nick Kay had an absolute field day because if Price wasn't open after setting an on-ball where you just had to screen your own guy, then Nick certainly was open when he would set a pin-down screen on the five-man who would be sitting in the key, and he was wide open. And I think he finished with seven or eight three-pointers. So mm. it was uh, certainly a unique series for many reasons, but none more so than a, a diamond <laughs> offense with <laughs> The triangle and two, so I don't expect that tonight. But you're right, Sydney under the guidance of Adam Ford, who obviously coached here and, and calls Perth home, uh, would have 
you know, be full of confidence coming out here and not too phased by the, the flight or the Red Army. And he finally gets to see his family too, which I'm sure he's happy about. Yeah, he did have a newborn uh, in the last season or right at the end of the season. So he'll, uh, he'll be excited to spend some time here with his partner and, and little one. Okay, we're here for the Domo Award though, thanks to Boomerang. Why don't you run through the two players that shared the one vote last week, Damo? Yeah, I, I couldn't go past giving some points to the Wildcats. Obviously, they went two and zip over the weekend, and you know they held the Hawks to 70 points. And then a few nights later, after jumping on a plane and playing against Sydney, they held the Kings. Now, those two defensive efforts are absolutely incredible. The Hawks obviously like to put some points on the board and then to back it up with a 65 points. Mm. While being the away team, I just thought it was brilliant. And at the helm of that, as I've said plenty of times in the last few weeks, John Mooney, I mean, his rebounding is just incredible. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he, when you can limit an opposition team to one shot, they better shoot a good clip and be taking the shots they want. Otherwise, it makes it very hard to put points on the board. And that's what we saw. Rebounding monster over the weekend to continue on from his form all season. And then Nordo. Uh, you know, to be holding to hold both superstar point guards under their season averages, but in particular, I had to mention Nordo for the one point with the job he did on Casper. Six points, obviously Casper getting in foul trouble, getting a tech foul to bring up his third went a long way to him being shut out of the game, in particular in that first half. But Nordo just shows his hands; he's the best containment defender in the league. Um, you know, like I've said previously, Sunday is probably the best pressure defender. But, you know, he stays in front of guys, contests with his chest, has his hands up, rarely fouls and rarely gets blown by and just makes that grind of 40 minutes tough for his opposition players. And you've seen that week in, week out with uh, who he's guarding and their quality opposition players. So six points for Casper Ware. I'm not expecting that tonight. I think Casper's going to be out there and putting on one of his better performances, but he's going to have to do it the hard way with Norto guarding him again. Now the two votes. Um, it was a big weekend for this for this guy. Um, first up in the first game against Chris Golding in Melbourne, I thought he did a great job. But but as he does, Golding got him sucked into a couple of couple of fouls, which ended up being pretty crucial. But then he backed up and he guarded Nathan Sobey for a lot of the win for his team. And and without without an import that day um, for the Bullets, Sobey was the key for the Bullets, and and he shut him down. Unlike we've seen him shut down this season. Yeah, you're exactly right. You know, as much as we talk about Bryce, Sobey has been incredible this year. But guarding him, remember it's an overtime game, yep. uh, the breakers. So Ta- Thomas Abercrombie played for 40 minutes and 53 seconds. And a lot of that was on Sobey in particular when it mattered. And, you know, he had three block shots. He contested just about everything he could. And with how athletic Sobey is, even though he's only about you know, six two, throwing on that taller, just as athletic Tom Abercrombie, I thought uh, did a very good job in, in slowing down. You know, the second leading scorer in the league. So to hold, hold Sobey, you know, <laughs> I was going to say hold him, but it's still twenty three points. But it was yeah. an overtime game. But more importantly, it's eight of twenty five. So thirty two percent. You know, four of fourteen from the field and four of eleven from the three point line. I thought Abercrombie backed up a, a great defensive performance the week prior and has uh, done it back-to-back weekends now. A, a big reason why, uh, you know, obviously they got a, an overtime win against a, a quality opposition in Brisbane. And then the three votes, this guy did a similar uh, job on Sobe on Monday night. Yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly right. I mean, I've, I've mentioned him a few times. You know I don't look at mm-hmm. the, the score so far because I, I wanted to genuinely be a surprise at the end of the year with who's awarded, but Simon has to be up there. I mean, he, he, the Hawks, they brought him out to be the, the Bryce Cotton stopper. Now, I'm not going to go ahead and say he did that when they played the Wildcats mm, no. in that first game. You know, Bryce obviously dropped 22, but 22 is still below Bryce's average. It is, yep. So you've got to credit him for keeping him below the average. But yeah, like you mentioned, to be able to play against Bryce, who just does not stop running, there's got to be some type of fatigue factor when you're trying to back up that a few days later. And the Hawks put on a clinic, 96-72 against Brisbane. And yeah, and as you've already mentioned, to be able to go from the leading scorer in the league to then backing it up against the second leading mm. scorer in the league. Sobey, 11 points, 5 of 14 um, from the field. He shot well from two, but only eight looks, 5 of 8. And then yeah. all of six, three-point line. I mean, you know, some of it, you know, some guys do have just off-night shooting. But in this case, I'd like to say that uh, Simon had a lot to do with that in the 20 minutes because pretty much all of that 20, he was guarding Sobey. 
Absolutely. So we won't read out the leaderboard here because we don't want to prejudice your votes moving forward. But if you want to check out the leaderboard, have a look at our social media pages. But Damo, before we let you go, we're here thanks to Boomerang. What are you most looking forward to tonight? What's what's the one thing you go to RAC Arena excited about seeing? You do get caught up in the atmosphere, and I'm noticing that even as a commentator when literally I'm just listening to the three guys commentating from the box. They're in my ear, so I can't <laughs> always hear the roar of the crowd because I'm listening to the play-by-play commentary. But when it gets loud, it doesn't matter what Corey or Gazy <laughs> or whoever it might be is saying, you can't hear a thing. It's just all about the Red Army. So the energy of the Red Army, and this is a, a game that means a lot to both teams. Obviously, after you know, it's a grand final rematch, and that special matchup we get to see of you know Casper Ware versus Bryce Cotton, two of the best ten players over the last decade, and uh, it's a genuine rivalry. Casper got the tech foul, mm. mouthing off to Bryce. Let's yeah. not forget about that. So I'm hoping they're given a, a little bit more leeway to you know show that passion, and, and if they want to chat to each other, then go for it. Yeah, but uh, we're only hours away from finding out. Now, we've got a heckler in the crowd for you tonight as well. Sean said he's going to try to get in your ear from the stands tonight too. <laughs> Mate, I ignored everything you said for seven years as teammate. <laughs> I've no problem doing 40 minutes. But... <laughs> oh, fantastic. Thanks very much, Damo. We'll be back again next week. Thanks, Pikey. Thanks, Boomerang. Big thank you to Damien Martin for the Damo Award. Thanks to Boomerang. And now, here on Hoop 7's Basketball Hustle, it's time for the Tab Touch preview. And Matty Knight will be with me shortly, but we're just so proud to be able to team up. We've got three Perth Wildcats championship winning legends here with us on Hoop 7's Basketball Hustle every single week Damien Martin, Mad- Matty Knight, and Sean Reddige. And we're just so proud to, to team up with a, with a successful and proud and a community minded. WA organisation like Tab Touch. So check them out, tabtouch.com.au, and especially check out all of the NBL betting markets right now. Everything you could ever hope for betting on a game, all of the the, the top scorers, the rebounders, all of the, the game, game line bettings, the margins, anything you could ever hope for, just head to tabtouch.com.au. Remember to gamble responsibly. And now I'll be joined by Matty Knight as we try to help you find, find a winner here on the Tab Touch preview. Unfortunately, Matty Knight wasn't quite able to join us this week for our our Tab Touch preview, but we'll be back with him next week. And he's got he's got a lot on his plate right now. He's preparing his WA State Country team for the national championships next week over over in Victoria. Um, but we'll get his tips out and we'll get his multi bet available as well this week as we try to continue to raise some some money here on Tab Touch um, for charity. But um, let's take a quick look at the round twelve matchups in the NBL. Um, Thursday night, it all gets underway with a massive doubleheader, Easter Thursday. It starts in Wollongong, the Illawarra Hawks against the South East Melbourne Phoenix. And we've got the Hawks, thanks to Tap Touch, paying $1.72. And the Phoenix, with Mitch Creek back in the lineup, they're $2.05. Second game on Thursday night, as we just spoke to Damien Martin about. It's at RSA Arena, the Perth Wildcats on Tap Touch, are $1.36. Warm favourites up against the Sydney Kings, $3.20 in a grand final rematch. In the Good Friday action in the NBL, we've, we're have back to Melbourne, John Kane Arena, Melbourne United up against the Cairns Taipans, and we've got Melbourne $1.34 on tap touch against the Taipans, $3.30. Then two games on Saturday, the Sydney Kings hosting the Brisbane Bullets. Short turnaround from being in Perth on Thursday night for the Kings. And second up, Adelaide 36 is back home. Their first home game since way back before the NBL Cup. And they're up against the Illawarra Hawks. And then on Sunday, two more games to close round 12 in the NBL. We've got the South East Melbourne Phoenix at home to the New Zealand Breakers. And then back up to Cairns for the Cairns Taipans up against Melbourne United. So I'll be right back and we'll hear more from the scoring machine, Sean Redditch. Okay, welcome back to Hoop 7's Basketball Hustle. And it's a big few days ahead, Sean, in over Easter for Round 12 in the NBL. Why don't you run through the games and, and tell me tell me your thoughts? 
Well, it's going to be a big one on Thursday. Hawks in Phoenix. Uh, Mitch Creek is back, so we'll see how the uh, Hawks crowd um, deals with that. But I, I like the Hawks at home. I like the Wildcats on at home on Thursday. Friday night, I, I don't think you can look past United being at home either. So I'm going to go with United. Bullets are struggling with some injuries at the moment. So we got Kings on Saturday night. Hawks again on Saturday at, at, at Adelaide. Mm. And then on Sunday, you've got Phoenix. I've got them beating the Breakers. And then on Sunday, I got United beating the Taipan. So probably the, the best teams at the moment are, are getting wins. That's kind of the way I see it. I think that they're going to be able to build the, that little gap there between uh, top of the ladder and, and bottom of the ladder a little bit more this week. Yep. So we'll keep an eye on all of that. But there's been some big news away from the court this week as well, Sean. And I guess probably none more so than, than Mitch Creek's reinstatement um, at the South East Melbourne Phoenix. So the situation was he was initially charged with 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 assault, and then the first hearing was meant to be this week, but that's now been deferred until the end of the end of May. So initially, the the NBL Basketball Australia's Integrity Committee and the Phoenix had all decided that it was in his best interest and everyone's best interest that he would be stood down from duties for now. But now that that hearing has been delayed, they've decided that he can come back to play. Given those two charges are still hanging over his head, given the charges are pretty serious ones of the the damage done to the woman that has made the allegations, and given um, nothing has really changed in the situation except the hearing has been pushed back, I don't think I'm very comfortable with the change in, di- in direction and allowing him to be back out there. And it's more so just you don't want to draw attention to this situation and putting him out on the basketball court is the ultimate way of drawing attention to him right now. Um, what are your thoughts on the situation, Sean? Well, you know, we talked about a couple of weeks ago, actually, the way that it was handled, as I thought was the appropriate reaction, yep. Yep. Um, especially in the realm of where we're at in the world, what's happening, especially in Australia, Australia politics. Mm. I think that there's, you know, a lot more attention given to to this subject. So... I think it's one of those things where it, to where, to where I'm reading it is the NBL has a rule that doesn't have a rule similar to, I guess they're saying in NRL has a rule that if you are charged with, uh, you know, an assault or something that you can be stood down without, um, but fault. because so, so, yeah, yeah, without, without any fault, judgment. yeah, without any, yeah, but where I guess the NBL doesn't have it. So they don't have the actual right to um, stood and down. So then it becomes the club's, discretion in my understanding um and so the phoenix are saying that um you know it's this is a a case that's still being drawn he hasn't been convicted um and so we still want him a part of the club i'm not a big fan of that reasoning um and i think to me if if mitch creek is your eighth or ninth or tenth guy is he allowed back in the club i don't think he is Mm -hmm. And it, so it kind of feels like I know you got to treat each situation, each player a little bit different. But I just wonder if this would be the same scenario. Would you allow your eighth, ninth, or tenth guy, or you know, Mitch Creek, which is pretty hard to replace, is he allowed to be back in when he's contesting? I, I hope you know these charges aren't are found to not be true. Yeah, but I think you got to I think you got to allow that to play out. And if, if he has been charged, there's definitely there's some evidence there that that points to. That being the case, it's not like this. Yeah. You know, this is a baseless ac- accusation. No. They wouldn't be bringing charges if that was the case. Exactly, and as we talked about a couple of weeks ago, there's actually physical evidence of what happened. So somebody has done it to this woman, and she has accused it that, that it's Mitch. And we'll wait and see if it turns out that it is him. But I just feel like him being out on the court it puts a target on his back now. And when he, you touched on it before, talking about playing in Wollongong. Um, tonight, when he heads into opposition venues, I feel like he's now becoming a target, and it just draws attention to it to this issue. And I think that yeah, the, the league and the club could have avoided it by not playing him. But at the same time, I understand their decision because with Mitch in the team, they're a championship threat. I don't think they are if he doesn't play. So I I can understand both sides of it. I, I suppose. Yeah, and then there are other statement they've come out and said he's not he's allowed to play, but he's not allowed to do any community engagements. He's lost mm-hmm. his captainship so there's there's some things that have been taken away but i i think that i'll um 
And even the Olympics have come out now and said that he's not eligible because he's been charged with the. Oh, didn't, um, I, didn't, I didn't see that part. Okay. So they're they're saying that that's part of that's what was in the paper today was that that um, you know part of being you can't be charged with that type of charge an assault mm. charge and be eligible for the Olympic team. Now, if yeah, he gets okay. cleared, then maybe that makes him eligible. But at the yep, moment, sure. the understanding is that he's not eligible for that. So he's not eligible for the Olympics, but he's can play because the NBA doesn't. It's probably something they're going to look at in the off season. I think so. I think the right the way the NRL does it, I think is the best right now. They've got a situation now with one of their players where he's facing or he was facing a rape charge and he was stood down. They didn't they weren't saying he was guilty, but they're just saying until it's sorted, you just have to be stood down and and he, he, it's just in the best interest of everybody, I think. Yeah. No, I I, I agree. So we'll, we'll see um, how that how that all plays out. Now, some other disappointing news. Um, Alex Pledger, one of your old foes from the New Zealand Breakers, um, he's, he's been diagnosed with colorectal cancer. Um, he kind of wasn't expecting it. He just went in for a checkout when he wasn't feeling well, and it turns out he might have been dealing, the, dealing with this for a little while. Um, we've talked about him a little bit on this show this year, talking about how we wouldn't mind seeing him come back, and there's probably some roles in across the league that you know he could fill right now, but... Yeah, unfortunately, he's now got a got a much bigger battle on his hands. Yeah, it's a uh, yeah. You feel really, really bad about that situation, and you know nothing but respect for Alex Pledger, and we wish him all the best. You know, and I think it kind of probably just puts things in perspective. I mean, you know, basketball is important, but your health and and uh, you know, living a, a healthy life come, comes first, and you, you just don't expect it with a uh, with a guy that young to be dealing with something as serious as that. So it's a um, it's one of those things. You know, there's been some great support put out there in the in the basketball community, and, and wish Alex all the best as he you know fights this. It's going to be you know, I'd imagine that's going to be a, a tough journey, but uh, you know, he's he's overcome a lot of things to. Uh, to become an incredible basketball player and, and wish him all the best on, on his recovery. Yeah, he's, he's had a fantastic basketball career. He's, a, he's one of our favourites here on the show. He joined us last year on Hoop 7's Basketball Hustle, so we certainly wish him all the best. And just finally, one another one of your old foes, Mika Vakona. Um, if you're starting up a basketball franchise, um, is there anyone in Australia or New Zealand you would want involved more than Mika Vakona, who's just just joined in an off off court role with the the Tasmania Jack Jumpers? Yeah, I, I, it's a great signing, um, mm-hmm. you know. And, and Scott Roth coming in, you know, he knows the league, but he knows know the league inside and out. So to be able to get a guy Mika Vakona with his experience and caliber of uh, of the individual that he is, I think that's great to have him and just be a mentor to some of those, the new players that they saw. In. And I think that, you know, that's a huge wrap for, for Tasmanian Jack Jumpers to get him on board. I, you know, and that's, you know, I look at the winners that, you know, come out of, come out of the New Zealand Breakers. I'm surprised that those guys aren't involved with the Breakers club. You know, look yep. at Dylan. I mean, obviously Dylan Boucher was up until last year. Okay, you man. know, Paul Hanari, Mika Bacona. I just... It, it kind of irks me a little bit that those guys aren't still involved because, you know, they built that club up to yep. some incredible, tough, hard-nosed playing caliber club. And it just doesn't feel like that's the case. But, you know, I mean, the Jack Jumpers, Tasmania, got to be excited they got Mick and on board. Absolutely. All right, Sean, it's been, <laughs> been a lot to get through. And now, all of a sudden, in a matter of hours, we'll be looking forward to seeing... The Hawks play the Phoenix, and then the Wildcats play the Kings on a, a big Thursday night doubleheader. So it's been a big show here thanks to Hoop7 once again, and thank you to the support of Tab Touch and also to Boomerang. I'll sign off and, and leave you, the scoring machine, with the final say. Well, look, I'm not sure if you're a Wildcat fan, you're going to be happy hearing this, but I'm going to be in the crowd tonight <laughs> at the Wildcats. Only in the second time, I believe, since mm-hmm. uh, I retired. Um, Damian Martin's got the sideline duty. So um, last time I went, the Wildcats lost. So I'm hoping mm. um, that is not the, the scenario tonight. But, uh, yeah, I'll be in the crowd cheering on the Wildcats and looking forward to uh, to a great night of NBL basketball.